I'm a Pommy, this is a podcast. Welcome to the show. I have a special guest and friend on today, Mr. Lloyd. Um, just to, just before we kick things off, just a quick shout out to our venue sponsors, the London Hotel. Obviously, Christmas around the corner. Make sure you book your work parties down at the London Hotel. Come down to a darts night on a Wednesday or just pop down and say hello to the guys. Food's good, biz, nice and cold. So just come down to the London Hotel. If you require any assistance with your home loan, refinancing, equity release, anything of that nature, please get in touch. My details will be down in the description below. Let's kick things off. Lloyd, how are you doing, mate? You're very good at that, aren't you? <laughs> that was amazing. Oh, this is like episode 12 now, yeah, so I'm, good I'm basically a fucking yeah, I know. professional. I could never remember all that. <laughs> I'm a superstar, mate. <laughs> no, good. Thanks for I'm having famous, me. mate. One of my videos went viral on TikTok, so Did I'm it? fucking, yeah, I've got 99 subscribers on YouTube now, so wow. I'm, I'm basically fucking, is TikTok a good, do you know what I mean? Is TikTok like a good platform for it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose so. Yeah. I still don't really understand it, to be no. honest. But yeah, you, you post things and sometimes people like them or they get triggered, mm. which boosts it up. But yeah, I always so stayed I away from TikTok. I feel like that's just a deep wormhole for me to kind of already get yeah, sucked you, into. I, I've, I've been sucked into a couple yeah, of hours of scrolling sure. on there. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah so I, yeah. Now, now I open it up like twice a week to post okay. and then turn it off. Yeah, like I'm already, um, Instagram reels already get me and get me in uh, death scrolls for too long, so yeah. I have to I have to stay away from them. But no, it's cool. It's good to be on the podcast. I've uh, watched enough of them over the years and listened enough of them. So yeah, it's cool. It's been yeah, you, Thanks, you, you like a good podcast. I do, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so for those people that don't know you, which is nearly everyone listening to this, yeah, exactly. to this um, just give me like a quick i don't know snapshot of your kind of upbringing where you're from just a just a like a, a brief overview of your background basically uh yeah cool i am um, i grew up in england um and i was your typical little naughty kid um ran around and um yeah got in trouble a lot and stuff like that and then i came over to england australia in about 2012 um, and I had plans to travel around and go and do see a lot of stuff and I ended up staying and um, working hard and creating a business. Um, I, I planned to go and see a lot of different places and stuff like that but um, this kind of amazing place kind of kept me, kept me here. What type of trouble did you used to get in when you were younger? Mate, a lot. <laughs> I, um, I, was pre I went to three different schools. I yeah. got kicked out of every single one. I think I was just a class clown. I think I didn't have a lot of role models around me when I was young. And um, I think that looking back now, um, I ended up latching on to a bit of a bad crowd. Yeah. Um, mates would go out and start fights with people, smoking weed, <clears throat> stealing and stuff like that. And I think that I was just a, um, a lost little kid. Yeah. And um, when, you, uh, when you're that lost, you latch on to anyone around you. And the people that I latched on to weren't necessarily that good. But um, yeah, I never did anything too crazy, but I'd be arrested multiple times. Um, I even... Um, yeah, got done for tipping a car over one night. We used to go and get really drunk and um, just go out and just cause absolute terror in the neighborhood that we grew up in. And we'd go along and people would take blammer hammers and blammer hammer car windows and stuff like that. Looking back now, it's bloody horrible, but you're uh, drunk little kids running around like uh, crazy people. And mm -hmm. then there was a mini metro stood at, uh, on the side of the road and um, someone went over and just started lifting it up and we all went over and just tipped it over. And then next thing I know, cops came around. I tried running off and got nicked and spent the night in the in the cells. In the cells, man. yeah, one of the, one of one of many times. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I've just um, I like playing around a lot, a lot, and I think I had a lot of anger in me. I think um, uh, I think that I was just looking for some sort of direction and um, found it in just kind of being a little git, really. It's funny because. Um I think a lot of young men, if they don't mm. have a role model, for sure. I think we're like we're really lucky now with some parts, of, some elements of social media and YouTube and podcasting and stuff like that. Is where if people don't have a role model, they can they can find one, you know, absolutely. online, absolutely, you know, and, yeah, and absolutely. Sit and listen to a three-hour podcast with myself. No, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, no, I mean, like you know, guys like Jordan Peterson and Chris Williamson and all, all these. No, absolutely, there's a know, lot characters. more data out there, isn't there? There's a lot more people to kind of latch on to and yeah. stuff like that. I, yeah, like, well, I, I could definitely do with that. I think like young kids, if they don't, it, it, there's a lot of a lot of gang culture comes from a lack of role model. Mm. I think absolutely. And that's when you get into trouble and you're getting arrested and things like that. And I think like for for a short period of time, I went down that avenue. <clears throat> I got arrested 
you know, multiple times. Like, luckily, just an overnight, you know, yeah. slap on the wrist. Yeah. Um, but yeah, fucking, it's just mad. Like, I remember when I come over to Australia and, you know, they go, have you got a criminal record? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you go, nervous. You go, yeah. oh, I, am, I remember my missus gave me that look and she was like, you, you'd be right. I was yeah. like, I was like, oh, well, there's a few things that I did when I was young and stupid that yeah, I, exactly. you know, regret doing now. Um, but, you know, luckily they were all just sort of caution situations. And, and actually I remember I, uh, I, I got into an altercation uh, once where this young lad, we, on, on our college ground, mm. the car park went onto a bricklaying shed mm. where the, all the, all the brickies were learning their trade. Right. And, um, one of the lads gives me a ring and he's like, Ross, you're, I'd, I'd bought this like old 1996 coupe BMW. It's like 1600 quid, but I'd s- save my own money for it, whatever. Got into an argument months before with these guys in a nightclub, silly stuff, just like egotistical alcohol behavior, you know, mm. men being men. And uh, <laughs> my mate calls me up and he goes, um, you got cement all over your car, Ross. I was like, what do you mean I've got fucking cement all over my car? I haven't washed it in a couple of weeks, but I haven't got cement. What are you on about? I haven't got cement. And he's like, no, no, no. You have cement all over your car. And I was like fuming with anger. Like, can you imagine like your pride and joy, Absolutely, first car you yeah, bought, yeah, whatever. Sure. And um, <clears throat> I was just leaving college to then uh, start my training in the Marines. Came back on Christmas leave. So you had a two-week break. Came back on Christmas leave. And this was about six six months after the incident. And I still didn't know who'd done it. I go into the local nightclub, drink too much, catch up with friends that I haven't seen for a while. And this guy in the toilets is like, bet you're still wondering who did that to your car, aren't you? And you just know instantly, you motherfucker. Cheeky, yeah. It's you, yeah. Absolutely. Um, thank God. Like, we obviously got into a massive punch up in the toilets. <clears throat> I luckily got thrown out by my mate. Um, and he was like, Ross, just, just leave. Because, uh, like... A lot of people won't know this, but in the UK, sometimes you have like an SOS bus, or which yeah. which has which basically, if you get too drunk, they'll wrap you up in like foil, and then they'll give you like coffee to try and sober you up and stuff. I never saw that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. they did in our area. They used to have an really? SOS bus for everyone because it was a nightmare down our strip. We're like a horse racing town. All the bars and clubs down one strip, and it's just it's carnage at two o'clock. Sounds lovely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but next to it, treatment? next to it is a riot van. Okay. So you've got the SOS yeah, bus okay. and riot van. Anyway, his mate had gone outside yeah. and he was like gunning for me, you know, and you just see red. And, you know, I was like 18 at the time. Yeah. We had a punch up in front of this, basically in front of the fucking riot van. Like, how stupid could you be? Yeah. Like, you know, but you're full of alcohol and your testosterone's gone through the roof. And I've just found out this had happened. And um, they chucked me in the back of the van and I end up going to Bury St. Edmunds police station. And the, the police officer, they pull up when you join the military. And they know. So they know that you're in training. They've got, it comes up. There must be something that comes what, up. What, it comes up with the police? Yeah. Okay. So your record will come up and say it's like in the military. Yeah. Um, so he like opened the door and he was like, he was like, Ross, seem like a good lad. You can't do this. He's like, you literally need to stop. He was like, you, you're on about your fourth caution now. He's like, really, we should be giving you a bit more of a, you know, we're being a bit lenient with you. Mm. You need to not do this stupid stuff anymore. You've got a good thing going for you. You're halfway through your training. And that was the first male person who had ever told me that I needed to control what I was doing. Yeah. Because everyone else around me was just like, yeah, you know, if he says this, you know, you punch him back and you do this and no one's really telling you about the consequences. When you turn 18, suddenly it's like, well, actually this can turn into a six month sentence or Absolutely. whatever. Yeah. Um, it's so a bit more real then, doesn't it? Did you yeah. did you ever have a moment where you were like, "Whoa, oh, this is a bit silly now." Like, what am I doing? <coughs> yeah, I did actually. I um, when I was, I I didn't get brought up with my dad. Uh, my dad wasn't around. My mum wasn't around. I got brought up with my gran, and then um, my dad was in prison at the time. And um, when my dad came out of prison, I ended up going and living with um, his new girlfriend straight away. Um, and that 16 year, from 16 to 19, that period there was just carnage. I ended up. Um, selling drugs or selling weed and stuff like that and just because I got kicked out of my dad's house and then I just went completely crazy lived in a DOS house and um, just carried on selling weed and just doing fucking crazy shit Wednesday night parties 20-30 people in the house it got to a point when I was about 19 and um, 
I got held up by knife point at one point um, by some guy I was trying to sell some stuff through and ended up in a massive amount of debt. And um, I had to reach out to my auntie who um, I never met before really um, because we were separated when we were young. Um, and she kind of bailed me out. And at that point before that, people were trying to come around and find me and stuff like that. And I think that was the point there when I was like, mate, what are you doing? Yeah, I've always thought myself you? at that point in my life as a really good person and as a really good kid. And I think I just kind of not had the chances a lot of people had. Um, at that point, it's like, nah, you are a little, little shit. You yeah, know? You're, you're a little you're, It's not because yeah. of anything else, it's because of you. Yeah. And um, it was that point where I was like, I gotta get out of here. So my auntie gave me a chance to go and live with her in Brighton. And I lived there for about a year. And then a year after living with her, I ends up, that's why I ended up coming here because I ended up staying with her brother and my uncle who I hadn't met before. So I think it got to the point where it was just like, something's got to give, mm -hmm. you know? I always wanted to, when I was growing up, I always really thought that I could be something more than I was because I was, I was, I had such a difficult chance to kind of get to where I wanted to, but I had a desire to be there and I didn't know where it was. Um, so when that kind of point got, it was like, okay, you say you think you're this, you say you can do all this. Well, you haven't shown me anything. Yeah, it's the kind of conversation I have in my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's like, <clears throat> what are you going to do now? You know, is this what is this the sort of life I'm looking yeah. around? And if I had stayed in England at that point, I would have <clears> gone to prison. A lot of my mates back home, a lot of my best friends um, yeah. in prison right now, you know, and yeah. I would have ended up going that way for no fault. I can understand people do it, you know. Mm. Um, if you got brought up in Sydney, in the other hands, you know, um, I think it would have been a bit different. But um, it... Um, I don't regret, I do regret that sort of stuff, but at the same time, I don't think I'd be where I am without it. You know, yeah, I yeah. had to hit sort of a low point. How did the, of, how did you, so you were living with your gran until yeah. you were 16? I was living with my gran until I think about 15, 16. 15, 16. I can't quite remember it. I what was, was your dad in prison for? My, my dad essentially went to prison for the manslaughter of my mum. So, oh. yeah, so when I was about eight or nine years old, I went on holiday to Spain. And this is, I can't quite remember everything. And when I came back from Spain, um, there was a load of police officers at my house. And um, they just arrested my dad right there. And then the woman, uh, I was kind of, I, I wasn't quite sure the, who, who the woman was. Mm. I was um, the woman I was living with, my dad, I thought it was my mum, but it turns out it actually wasn't. It was kind of like his new partner. Long story short, um, that was the summer holidays before I started high school or yeah. secondary school mm. and then the court case <clears> went on and ended up becoming like a front page thing on the sun and stuff like that there's paparazzi outside the house every single day um, I used to have to put like a, a face mask on a little um, like a bunny mask on to go and open the gate and stuff like that because mm. everyone was kind of taking photos and stuff like that so fucking heavy mate yeah it was, it was look back, looking back at the time it was really heavy it was hectic so then I was living with my two sisters and then we kind of got split up um, as when my dad eventually got convicted I lived with my gran. My gran came from Oxford and rented a house where I, my hometown was and left her, well, my granddad, her partner at the time. He stayed in Oxford and came down on the weekends. Mm. And then um, she raised me for a bunch of years. But I think at that point in time, when I just started secondary school, that sort of shit happening in the news, like, you, you're doomed. Yeah, you're <laughs> you're doomed, doomed from the yeah. fucking start. Well, we, Do you know what I mean? Yeah, we had, um, we, our school was the Holly and Jessica Ah, situation. I think Des mentioned that. Yeah, yeah I think so Des we, mentioned that. And, and Con, who's just been on the show, um, <laughs> like, it was, it was fucking carnage. Like, the school was just carnage. Yeah, like, for sure. There were so many reporters outside yeah. the school, and it was like our first year in secondary school, mm -hmm. and these two girls had essentially been <coughs> killed and burnt and put into a bin, or I can't remember where they found them. God, I, um, is that what happened? Yeah, yeah. And Jeez. then, um, well, it was it was fucking international, wasn't it? You can still remember the football tops they were wearing. Yeah. Like it, it's um, it just threw like a like a whirlwind into the school, mm. and I think we, like, I don't know what our, our particular year group because it was like essentially the same year group. We were, we were extremely rebellious when it came to like just we were like what like it's just it was mental the caretaker had fucking done this to two kids and like I just remember no one going out mm. like we probably spent like the next two years of me just like you know you used to have to ring your mate on the 
you know, you have to know the number off yeah, by heart, absolutely. or you have to go around and yeah. knock on the door. Uh, they were the good days. <laughs> yeah, they were the good days. You like riding, People were never riding that around in the village, like yeah. knocking on. Is so and so in? I know they were the good. Times. And no one was coming out because everyone's parents were like, "Fucking, there's a murderer on the loose." Um, but yeah, it was just fucking. Hard. But I can't imagine it like being. It was hectic enough just being around it. Sure. Let alone it being. You yeah, know, for in, sure. Man. In the family, like it was. It was, uh, yeah, it was traumatising for the whole family. It kind of ripped the whole family apart for a lot of years. And um, the woman that uh, my auntie and I told you that bailed me out, I, that was her sister. And they, like, it was a whole thing, because the body never got found, ever. Um, mm. That was why it was such a big thing. Um, there was no kind of, like, clarity on it and stuff like that. So it, 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 um, it yeah, kind of kind of became a big thing. But um, she, she had been kept away from me. When I was young, I think mm. she kind of wanted contact, but because of the situation and stuff, I think my dad and the people I was living with kind of separated and stuff. So once I kind of got older and met her, um, I realised the pain it kind of caused in her as well. Mm. You know, where her sister just kind of went missing and stuff like that. So those sort of things they kind of have yeah. a have a <coughs> ripping effect. But at the same time, it in a weird way, it was the, probably the best thing that ever happened to me. And it, it sounds so crazy to say that, but. I ended up getting so much support from, when I look back, from women in my life, from yeah. older women who saw a, a, a young lad, nice young lad, and they took me in way more because of what happened to me than ever. And I wouldn't be where I am today without that support from those sort of people. Yeah. So I've always kind of looked at it like that. Um, and I think when you get to a certain age, when you get to about <clears throat> mid 20s, late 20s, whatever happened previously, Okay, up until that point, whatever happened previously, you can say that kind of has effect on you, and that's why you are the way you are. And then there's no excuse. There's after no fucking that. excuse after that. No, you've no. got the, all the opportunity to kind of yeah. decide who you want to be, to change it any way you want to be. So, um, I 100 percent fucking agree with that. Do you know what I mean? I think too many people don't log into that, didn't they? I think like, what's the age that you leave if you left uni? If you went to uni, what was it like 21? 21 about 21. that sort of thing. I yeah. feel like when you're 21. You're a fucking should, man now. Someone should just come up to you Absolutely. and be like, this is all on fucking you. All on you now. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't say that, oh, I've got anger issues because of this or shit. Yeah. You know it's who your you fault are. From then Absolutely. On. You're an adult. You're yeah, fucking, absolutely. you know, you need to make the right... You know, it's the it's the thing about the you know they do studies on twins, mm. the same fucking upbringing. Absolutely, one of them becomes a Different fucking attitude. heroin addict, and the yep. other one becomes a successful sure. business person, and that's purely because of their own decisions. Yes, absolutely. And, I, and, and I, I agree with you. Like, one, there should just be a a cut off point. Yeah, like a cut off you know? point where it's like, yeah. you're on your fucking you're on your fucking eye now. Yeah. You know, this is all on you. And I think yeah. a lot of people that. Um, I think a lot of people uh, struggle with that sort of accountability, you know. Mm. I've always looked at it in, in my life because it's taken me so long to understand my brain and the way that my brain takes information in. Mm. And I think I've, it's up to you to, to that certain point to then understand yourself, understand mm. your brain, know who you, what you are, know what you like, what you don't like, how do you take information, are you a visual learner, all that sort of stuff. If you're not willing to kind of do that, then enjoy being mm. who you are for the rest mm -hmm. of your sort of life. And you know, yeah. it's like you're trying to constantly improve and, and do all yeah. those sort of things, you yeah. know. And I, I'm well aware that I'm not an academic type. Absolutely, So I learn yeah. in a different way. In a different, and it, it, <clears throat> I didn't realise that until about mm. five, six years ago that I'm, yeah. I, 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 I'm, <clears throat> I think I'm, Maybe, maybe like some other people, I'm not the sort of person that picks up things straight away, mm. but that's actually a really good skill because I think some people pick things up really straight away, they then don't have to pro practice proper technique. They get caught up on that, you know? Yeah. And they stay there, they go, they elevate really quickly and then they just kind of stagger out. I take forever and just constantly just fuck it up. Keep trying. Just yeah, constantly fuck going. it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have to literally do it a hundred <laughs> times and I have to break it down to its core mechanics. Yeah. Okay, left foot, okay, what now? Oh yeah, yeah right, yeah. okay. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I think that's like, it took me a while, I used to hate that about <coughs> myself. And mm. it took me a while, I was like, hang on a second. If I didn't be so shit at the start, then yeah. I wouldn't put so much effort into kind of finding. And I that don't have a fear of asking questions. No, you do not. No. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, no, absolutely, um, yeah. But like, but I have to. Like, even when like like someone will say to me, "Oh, how did you go from being a marine to getting into finance, mm. right?" And now I work for like one of the best brokerages in the city, if not mm. the country, and I've done it in the space of two years, and. Um, it's because I'll sit next to Hong, who's my mentor, mm. and I'll be like, I don't know how to read a tax return. And he's like, okay, you just do it. Well, I, don't, I can't learn the way you're telling me. Yeah. So you're like, what does this number mean? Oh, that means that. Okay, what does mm. this number mean? 
what does that word mean? How mm. do I read that? Yep. Like, are like you coming over from another country? I've got to read people's pay slips. Mm. I know how to read a UK pay slip because yeah, I've fucking sure. seen it. But like, mm. when it comes to an Australian one, I'm like, I don't know what a super fund is. I don't know what X, Y, but if you can ask the questions and visually yep. see it, because yep. you can't just tell me. No, how to absolutely. Do it. You've got yeah. to show me how to absolutely. do it. Absolutely. I need I to I see go, the kind oh, of steps. Okay. And I think yeah. why as well. Someone, when I was laboring back in the day, I remember. I really wanted to impress one sort of builder and mm. he got a, he got a, a tradesman come in the carpenter and he was an absolute gun mm. and I really liked him and he would kind of kind of take me under his wing and just kind of give me some tips and stuff and I said what is it something that I can do to kind of improve in this kind of job and he said ask why don't just kind of get told to do something why are you doing it why that am way? I doing it yeah why am I yeah, doing yeah. it this way you know why does it have to be done and stuff like that and that sort of thing when you learn learning something is for me has been massive do you know what I mean yeah like okay we're learning this tax return. Okay. But why is it important that we kind of do this sort of stuff? Oh, yeah. okay. Then it's kind of, it makes sense. You're like, yeah, it, it clicks into place. Absolutely. You've got to understand that this has to be done. So there's a certain pressure now to kind of do it. There's a yeah. more interest in that. You've got to find some sort yeah. of anchoring thing to kind of get you invested into that sort of learning. Especially with me, I've got ADHD. I'll start something and then a butterfly will go past. Like, oh, you know, what's that? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I have to have some sort of anchoring sort yeah. of thing, you know? I'll start something, have a hyper focus, start it, and they'll be bored of it. So I've realized I then have to kind of find and redesign it again and make it interesting again, repackage it, and just kind of mm. anchor myself back in there. And stuff when like did that. you find out that you had ADHD? Um, I think it was when I, when I was young, because of how naughty I was. I mean, I would be climbing out of like school windows and climbing into the next class and stuff mm. like that. Like, I would just be kind of, you know, Putting pants down and running around the school playground and stuff. They you still pull your pants down? I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I'm not blessed in that area, so I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but I would, um, I would have a um, a lot of um, <clears throat> teachers kind of wanted to ask, you know, look into my kind of psyche and stuff like that. And mm. I would have a lot of counselling because obviously what kind of happened and stuff like that. And they kind of decided diagnosed that I had ADHD because I would never sit still. I mean, I mean, like I said, I got kicked out of three different schools. Do yeah. you know what I mean? I went to the first one, got kicked out after three years, second one six months the last one a couple mm. months I ended up in a pupil referral unit so I've never really looked into it since then but mm. um, that's what I got diagnosed with and stuff but as I kind of got a bit older it's difficult because you want to say okay my brain thinks and operates in this way okay I want to learn a little bit about it but then I don't again I don't want to use any excuse yeah, you know yeah, I mean yeah, I'm yeah. Like, oh, I can't learn yeah. that. I got ADHD so yeah, it's a yeah. careful balance of just kind of understanding that but um, yeah. it's um. It's a it's, it's a blessing in at all, in a, a blessing and a curse, I guess, in some ways. Yeah. When so when um, when did you when what year did you come out to Australia? I came out November twenty second, twenty twelve. Twenty twelve. Yeah. And what did you like? Because you've obviously built a very successful business. Yeah. yeah. Um, with one of our mates. Yeah. And um, it all started with you. Yeah. Sort of setting things up. Yeah. And I know you've got some like wacky stories about how you started <laughs> riding around on your bike and stuff. Yeah, but can you just sure. like run me through like how yeah. you landed in Australia and then because it's not the coolest job on the planet, right? It's horrible, on, yeah. Right, and it and it's but fucking like hard work. Yeah. And but mm. because it's not the coolest job and that not everyone wants to do Absolutely. it, which is why you can get Absolutely. very successful doing it. Yeah. Um. So just run me through like you get to Australia. What's the first thing you do? What's the first thing you start doing? And then how the hell did you get into doing what you're doing now? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so I came to Australia, as you mentioned, as I mentioned previously, kind of running away from a lot of problems there. I was living with my auntie or just reconnected to, and she put me in touch for the first time with her brother, my uncle. And he gave me the ticket to come out. I had no money. I had about a week's notice, sold everything I had, which was a car that they had paid for me, got like 600 bucks. You didn't so flip that one over? <laughs> no, I didn't flip that one over. No, I, I got other stories of burning other cars. <laughs> um, and then, so I came out and lived with him and worked with him. <clears> and um, he was a very powerful role model in a lot of ways, but also kind of a bit toxic in a lot of ways. But I worked with him and um, learned carpet cleaning when as soon as I got here, and which was essentially just scamming people, essentially. He would kind of, people, he would have a carpet cleaning business and he would, they would call him up and he would say oh yeah it'd be about 90 bucks and he'd send me there and I have to tell him instantly it's 200 and you have to kind of tell them why or try and blag them through and then get some water and put a tiny bit of detergent in it and um, do a terrible job and you know rip them off essentially um, and after about eight months of that I was like I can't do this I don't want to do this so 
I went on Gumtree. I replied to an ad on, um, on Gumtree, and it was this old guy doing what I currently do now. And I turn up my first day, um, and it's about 75, 70 year old man with big hunchback, and it's another guy's first day. And we turn up at this building site, and he's doing this weird thing, and he's digging these holes in the ground, big 400 mil, 500 mil diameter holes, and he's going down like six, seven meters, all by hand. A little T-bar at the top, pole comes down a bucket, and you turn it. He showed me a few times. Um, I was like, oh yeah, cool. And then he just went. And me and this guy just kind of carried on. Next thing you know, concrete turned up and a bunch of steel. And I kept calling him, calling him, what's going on here? What do I do? And stuff like that. And then it got to a point where I was like, okay, cool. Looked around, saw what I'd done previously, picked up the steel, chucked it in there and just started pumping. And I think from that moment there, he kind of put a lot of trust in me. Mm. Um, I think he'd been burnt before. But very quickly I realized that this was a niche. This was yeah. a very, very specific skill. What he's essentially doing is he's creating the basements for high-end luxury homes. And he's doing them all by a form of piling, which is drilling concrete columns into the ground continuously around the border. Yeah. And then you can excavate down while retaining the sand on the outside. And I was at a time in my life where I really wanted to do something. I always knew I wanted to do something and I had no idea what it was. But luckily, all of the previous jobs I'd done for pre previously, some little bit of skill kind of leaned into that. And um, I started to feel like, oh, you know what, I'm actually quite good at it. Um, and I, I just stuck at it. It was really, really hard at the start, um, doing a lot of shit jobs and just digging and digging on a shovel and all day and stuff. But Turning up on your push bike? Yeah. <laughs> when I eventually went out on my own um, after about a year, I still had no idea what, how, what I was doing. And my friends, two of my friends convinced me to do it. And I'd be reading plans and people, you know, trying to hustle for some work and get jobs. And I got my first job. Luckily, through my friend's recruitment company, he gave, me a, um, he gave me a list of contacts and emailed them. And eventually someone, don't know why they did, but they gave me a chance to do a basement project. But I was driving <laughs> around on a moped at a time. And um, I um, didn't want to turn up on site with my moped because I thought they're just going to... I was already young looking and I'm like doing, you know, $100,000 project and doing their whole basement for this like Turning 10 up on a million moped. dollar home. I'm going to turn up on a moped. <laughs> so I would put my shovel, and my augers and my tape measures all in my back and I would drive down the tunnel. I was living in the Northern Beach at the time, drive through the tunnel, park it there, walk onto site and just do a big, um, big show and dance and, and, and pretend and stuff like that. Um, and then from that job, I get another one and from that job, I get another one and the people in my market in my industry were all about 45, 50 years old and I always thought, well, okay, I can't be them but I can only be myself and they were trying to, lever uh, it was, I was looking at myself as a young lad, they're never going to choose me and I'm like, okay, well, let's try and flip that, what, let's try and turn that into a positive. I am young, you know, yeah. but I can work harder than them. They've got families, they've got this. I can put in more hours. I can get the job I can quicker. do more, do you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> I am new but I'll take on anything so I would then get drip fed all the jobs that they wouldn't want and these are piling jobs in the back garden full of backfill that's horrible you know you just mm. dig in a hole and take your 10 hours and it just collapse and redo it again you won't get paid for it and redo it again redo it again but through that attitude of I'll do this as best as I possibly can and a very very long term thinking eventually you kind of build a reputation which was always my plan was to spend as much time as I could being as good as bloke as I could and always focus on long term relationships because yeah. <clears throat> I always felt from my limited time of limited business knowledge that I could start a job and if it starts going bad I could then try and squeeze in for more money but then they're not going to refer me yeah. they're not going to get any more work from me and nothing more is going to happen that. so I would just decide right I'll just quote it the best I could do the job best I can. If it starts going tits up, here's what it is. Save the client, protect the client, protect the relationship, make sure everything's perfect. Every little detail would be perfect. Doesn't matter if it's gonna, not getting seen or not, I'm gonna see it, I'm gonna know, and I need to walk out there and know that I've done the best I possibly can. Yeah. And I make a load of mistakes, right? Like everyone does, you make a load of mistakes, you're not very good at it, but through that kind of hunger of wanting to kind of do better, I built a reputation. And then my, my big current business partner, Des, came in, and um, he's fantastic at hustling and finding all his works and selling the product and selling all these sort of things. And eventually- The yin to your yang. The yin to my yang, you know, complete. <clears throat> when we first met, we kind of both thought we were kind of really similar and we realized eventually we're not similar. We're completely opposites, but we've got similar morals. Yeah. And that's what you need to- And you to contribute to each other, yeah. Contribute each other and <clears throat> stuff like that. Difficult to kind of manage, but um, from there, the business just started growing and growing and growing. And we would kind of go from one employee to two employees and then, 
one car and then he would have a moped and then we got rid of his moped in the car and stuff like that so it's um it's been a a, a long long journey but we we had a bit of a six seven year plan of just be good guys work as hard as you can and focus on the highest quality product you possibly can and the highest level cost of service you possibly can um and it's worked it worked up to this point anyway yeah it could all go downhill at any moment that's the thing <laughs> <laughs> you know you're always worried about that I hopefully guess, the yeah. garage doesn't go down yeah well. absolutely uh, you know it's a, it's a careful balance though isn't it it's a careful balance of you do well your confidence goes up Right, yeah. You don't want to get carried away yourself, yeah. though. And then you got, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then you, know you got to I mean? move to the next step, Absolutely. and that scares you a little bit. And that bit scares and you, you go, a little bit more, and you know. You and you're like, oh, okay, I'm getting good at this now, but you need to know that it, you take your foot off the gas for a start, but you know, you could yeah. lose it all, you yeah. know. So it's that careful balance of keeping that fear around, but not being consumed by it. Yeah. You know? And that's a skill. And yeah. I think I, I listened to Israel Adesanya on the podcast talk about pressure being an acquired taste, and I think that's something that I've kind of looked at as, as well. Yeah. It is we, an acquired taste. We used to say, like, if you fear it, you should lean into it. For sure. And yeah. it, is that like a Marine saying, is it? Yeah. Or is they that just a Ross to, saying? Yeah. <laughs> a Pobby podcast no. saying? Yes, Pobby podcast. <laughs> Copyrighted. Copyright that for the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Add that to the speech I said in the that. front. It was me, yeah, 2023. <laughs> <laughs> Ross and Rand 2023. Yeah. Um, if you fear it, you can lean I believe into you it. would say that. Though. I would believe you said that. I believe you it. Convi that's convince you, yeah. the more confusing. That's my life. <laughs> um, but yeah, you used to say like, I don't know, fucking, we used to do all sorts of shit, abseiling. Like, I remember like when you, when you pulled the trigger for the first time and it, uh, on, a, on an actual round, like not like a blank round, like mm. an actual round and you're like, and the, this Irish guy would be like, it's like losing your virginity. <laughs> and I was like shitting myself going, eh, like you know like you're yeah. like fuck I'm gonna squeeze the trigger it's a real one um, and then and then you sort of and then that becomes the new normal mm. right so they, For sure. like, you guys have scaled like uh, like I would say you've scaled naturally but you've also just kept your it foot has. on the pump aggressively the whole time way. and we've like, just you know? yeah absolutely it has <laughs> been you bought a load of machinery haven't you and you just you grow in confidence you back it and I think you kind of you look at something that you don't do and you think oh my god that's terrifying and or I need to kind of know everything about it before I start it. You don't. Or I need to kind of wait for the perfect time or something like that. And my old jiu-jitsu coach used to always tell me, Lloyd, he said, Lloyd, you can, everyone always wants to wait for the perfect time. There is no right time. There's only now, you yeah. know? And that's so true. You can kind of wait until you're ready for something or you're, you're never going to be ready. It's never going to be ready. The only, mm. you get to a certain point of preparing for something where you can't go any further and you need the pressure of in it and I might fuck it up to push you to that next level, to carve you out. You know, it's like when um, The Dark Knight, you seen The Dark Knight? Yeah. You know, I don't know, is it The Dark Knight or is it? I don't know. The one where he's trying to scale the prison wall. Oh, yeah. And he yeah. can't make that <clears throat> jump because mm. he's got the rope on it. And someone says, you've got to take that rope off. And it's that fear of fucking it up and failing. It's going to launch into that. It is that, you know. And I've had yeah. a lot of friends kind of speak about it, you know, the success that we've kind of grown to and the scale we've kind of grown to. And... I'm not any sort of fantastic, brilliant mind or anything like that. Rocket you know, scientist. Not, not at all. Far from it, really. Yeah. Far from it. And I said, it's nothing that I've done that you can't do. The only thing is there is I've accidentally put myself in high pressure situations. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Oh, shit. Where the fuck am I? Oh, better work hard now. You know what I mean? And the best thing you can do is just It's like for um, it. Richard Branson always say, just if you if you don't know how to do it, just say yes and then figure it out later. Figure it out later. And yeah. that, uh, that's <laughs> something else I heard a long time. That's absolutely bang on truth. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, mm. just do it and figure it out while you're doing it. Yeah. And I think it takes, I don't know, I think it takes a certain awakening or, or an opening, you know, going on some course or some someone explaining that to you. Me and Des went on a, um, a business coach, not business coach, how do I... We went on a you know that course I was talking about? Yeah, like a where, workshop course. Thing, yeah, yeah, a workshop yeah. course. It's basically this guy called Aaron Sansoni, and he's like a entrepreneur. And we went on this four-day course to learn how to buy businesses with no money down. And we went on there, and it just blows your mind. Whatever you think is reality, or what you think is possible, what you, you don't realise the like, there yeah, is yeah. just like another door. There's another thing. And sometimes it takes an experience, or good or bad or whatever, for you to kind of go, shit. I thought this and I've been thinking like this and it's like there's just so much more available mm. to you um, and I think you only really get that by surrounding yourself with people that are a lot better than you mm. and that's one of the things that kind of ended up pushing me on is when I first came out here I ended up hanging I was 22 23 I ended up hanging out with 45 50 year olds all the time um, yeah, I always tend to hang around with older people you know, like generally. they had nice houses they had this sort of mm. stuff and I wanted that yeah. You know, I looked at that, they were driving nice cars and they were kind of not worrying about money. I would always kind of go to 
I, I would never pull the subway or something. I'd be terrible with money, you know? Mm. I'd just get the money, spend the money, but by surrounding myself or, or anyone surrounding himself with better people, you will pick up those habits. Mm. As simple as that, you know? Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Absolutely. It is like that, you know? They say, <laughs> what is it? Summary of the five people you hang out with, yeah. you know? And that's probably why I ended up in such a shit situation when I was growing up. Because if I look at it, the people I was hanging out with weren't that great, you yeah. know? Yeah. And um, I'm... I'm I'm at a stage in my life where I'm really selective about who I hang out with. Really, mm. you know, I really I'm, only. I'm super grateful. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> you should be. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but you you're like that. You know, I think um, I think my first real hanging out with you is when we were kind of like at New Year's Eve, you know, and everyone else mm. was partying, and me and you were just talking about what we were going to do and the plans we were going to go. Yeah, and yeah. We were talking about Tony Robbins and stuff like that, and you introduced me to Tony Robbins. He just, uh, he just finished writing Money, money Master, money the, master game. the Game, yeah, that yeah, big old that thick book. That was, a, like, that was the fattest book I've ever fat, read in my life. Yeah, it it was is. 700 yeah, pages. Sure. I, was, I actually shocked myself that I read the whole thing back to back. I was like, fuck. But it doesn't surprise me <laughs> that you're doing well in your, in your, in your business broken and stuff like that, because and your mortgage broken and your finance broken, because you do have that sort of mind you know mm. and I I look at the things some of the things you do and I think oh I should apply myself like that you know and I think that's one of the, the best things about hanging out with better people you should look at them and go fuck Jesus like, yeah 100% oh, he's doing that yeah. my god do you know what I mean like you're starting this podcast like you're hustling around cornering people and stuff like that and I look at myself and go shit I should probably do a little bit more you know yeah, what I mean I think I'm already doing a lot but I'm like hang around hang people that are doing like well elements of their life is better than yours or you aspire to be for like sure. that and that that helps you raise raise your game absolutely but for sure absolutely 100%. and when you have kids I guess that's when it comes even more important because you are now in charge of two little people yeah, yeah. you right. was one little person <laughs> now I've got two little yeah, people to look exactly. after Congratululations! Thanks, mate. But you're you're we'll now do a in parenting podcast. <laughs> when you're, when I could do some yeah. lessons. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Not yet, yeah. but it's coming. Yeah. But you're in charge now of their molding, right? Yeah. You're in charge. Kids are sponges, aren't they? You know, you're in charge of making sure that your friends have got those good morals and um, are going to learn those sort of things. I've um, I've always spent a lot of time with my mates' kids and stuff because, like I said, they're all older and stuff like that. And I look at it, and I've had. Um, I've been, I'm good with them, you know? I'm having a play and stuff like that, but I'm very aware that when I'm a father, that it doesn't mean that I've, because I've been, you know, great with kids before, that my kids are going to look at me like I'm sort of a superhero. Mm -hmm. They're going to be sick of me, you know? Yeah. So I'm going to need to make sure that they've got great role models and the great people around them that they can learn off and they can teach them stuff that I can never teach and stuff. It's, so. it's, it's a really funny thing when, um, when you find out, as a man, when you find out that you're about to have kids, you get this weird... Um, external sense of like like fuck like like suddenly all of your priorities change the and first you, time you got someone else that's more important than yeah, you and yeah. you go and you go why am I doing that and why am I hanging around with that person I don't want that person around my child yeah. I don't want that person influencing you know my little girl for sure like what, what am I what am I doing going and doing this why am I going on the piss absolutely. on a Friday and Saturday yeah, is night is that like, really you, gonna yeah, yeah absolutely that's not gonna benefit them nah. and you get this weird sense nah, of like oh all. okay this it's is all and Dana White did that interview with Piers Morgan mm. and he talked about his family die, like his parents dying and yep. stuff like that and, and then Piers Morgan says to him you know what? What? What legacy do you want to leave? He's like, "There's no fucking legacy after this. I want my kids to have said that they liked me." Yeah, that like, is. That's got to be the biggest fucking. Be thing, thirty-five, you know? forty, fifty years old, and your kids want to hang out with you. Want to like, hang could out? Could that with not you. be a very? I think better, that's got to yeah, be the up there. The, for sure, the biggest motivator. But yeah, it was this weird sense of like, oh shit, like I, I'm not doing that anymore. And I'm, you know, you 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 just prioritize and channel. Yeah, Absolutely. Go, Fuck, yeah. I don't want to hang around with these people. No, it is, it is all part of growing <clears> up. <throat> but it's, I find though that for me anyway, it's like you do all that, you hang out with those sort of people, right? And there comes a part of time in your life where you're changing from someone you were previously and then you're changing to the next person. And there's that limbo sort of thing, which yeah. I found myself in, you know, I'm. I'm not drinking at the moment. I'm trying to stay away from things that kind of pull me against my goals where I want to get to. And it's been about that. I'm just trying to step away from and certain relationships in my life that, if I'm honest with myself, are toxic for me. Mm. You know, people that are negative and complain and all that sort of thing. I want to step away from that. But 
haven't found that next sort of batch you know haven't kind of done those, those next they sort of say things. that going through your 30s is the hardest time for a man because <laughs> for sure. you, if you're if you're the type of person that's ambitious and progressive like you want to yeah. keep progressing because i don't think you ever reach a destination i think men men are the healthiest when they just keep progressing so yeah for young like for ambitious sure. men like us yeah it is like that it's yeah. a never ending chase, and then there's this it? spot yeah. in your 30s where the guys that you used to hang around with all the time aren't necessarily going in that direction yep. and you're losing interest with those people yep. and you're but you haven't quite quite you're not quite at that level yep. that you know you want to be at yeah for sure and you're just limbo. trying to find that thing and you're just in the middle like it's going difficult. Oh, like yeah but you've been on a bit of a journey of um, self-discovery and self I, sort I of think, yeah, in I the have. last six months, yeah. 12 months, I reckon. For sure. I think for, for for a while, mate, for a while, probably just running away from everything, you know what I mean, in my yeah. life, you know. I've um, I've been doing that sort of thing. But it is, it's, you've got to learn to, I guess, run your own race and not let those moments where you just spoke about, where you are transitioning, get the better of you because you've mm. got to be confident in who you are and, may, and, and the path that you're going and where you're going to go and down, um, it's a difficult skill, you know? It's a difficult skill of making yeah. sure you always listen to outside opinions, but don't let it kind yeah. of muddle your head, you know? Yeah, I think um, being grateful for being grateful throughout the process is probably the hardest thing to implement because you're you're like, oh, I want to be where that person yeah, is. Sure. But actually, you just got to enjoy the, the week to week. Yeah, rather sure. than Rather than like, you know, Tyson Fury talks about it all the time where he becomes heavyweight champion of the world and then he's depressed the next week because he had nothing else to aspire to absolutely um, so I think yeah just enjoying that fucking that I need to do that more is, man yeah. I need to do that more if I'm <laughs> on it if I'm brutally brutally honest with myself I always try to be I'm I've I um, one of Tony Rob things Tony Robbins taught me a while ago was um the importance of goal setting and stuff like that and it is massively important there's a 30 day personal power course that you can go on of his I did it like four years ago and um, each day he gets you to do the little things that you know you should have done you should have called your aunt or whoever it is you should have called or put tidy up that thing that you should have done and they kind of compound and snowball it and forces I'm, you to do it yeah. forces yeah. you to do you know little things and just ticking them off yeah, and getting yeah. an achievement and there was one day where you do like a 30 day um, you do like a um a big goal setting, all the stuff you want to do. And I found it not long ago, the thing that I did four years ago. And um, it was have a cage fight, it was have a certain amount of money in the bank. And I look back now and I kind of accomplished a hell of a lot of what I wanted to do. Yeah. But while I'm here, I'm just constantly looking at the next thing I want to get to and the next yeah, thing yeah. I want to get to. And that is not healthy. No. No, nah, it's not healthy. You know, it is that careful balance of making sure you don't get lost in it, you know, because as you get closer to a goal or you move it forward and you move it forward, the pressure amounts, you know, it gets mm. more and more and more consuming, you know, the higher you kind of, you kind of go up, you go mm -hmm. more consuming and um, you've got to be able to make sure that you kind of sit back and smell the roses sometimes. For sure, mate. You know, I, I, I'm saying it myself and I don't necessarily do it myself. Mm. Ask my girlfriend. I'm, it's difficult. I, you know, yeah. There's, there's, um, the, there's a lot of things that can put, <coughs> put you in perspective. I think obviously like there's a lot of shit going on in the world now mm. at the moment all over you know you're Russia Ukraine um, Palestinians and the Israelis mm. uh, Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia and all these countries that are fucking volatile and I think sometimes especially people in Australia take it all for a bit fucking for sure like, mate like, definitely you know yeah, I live sure. in a house with a swing in the backyard mm. And a fucking got yeah. two healthy kids and yep. all that type of stuff, and it's just like sometimes you just got to sit and go, life's pretty good. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <clears throat> and it's like yeah. how I've seen a lot of my friends who have come from not much and they've become something, and then they've had kids and they've just loved their kids so much and they've just given them everything they want. And then mm. those kids grow up and they don't appreciate it no, so more and mm. stuff like that. And I've kind of always thought when I have kids, what one thing I want to do is I want to maybe one day, one holiday a year, we go to blue in Africa or somewhere, you know, yeah. and you slum it and you just help and you work. And then maybe that might kind of give you that bit of perspective. Yeah, Isla's like three, so she started work about a week ago. And how are you finding it all? Yeah, she gives me all of her money. 100% <laughs> tax she? goes to dad. <laughs> yeah. She's actually quite funny now because like, she'll do jobs around the house. Yeah. Um, so she thinks it's fun at the moment to empty the dishwasher and sweep up. She doesn't really shitty job of sweeping up, but she comes and helps me, comes and helps me wipe down the car when I'm like washing the cars yeah. outside, she'll come and wipe it. Mm. But it, it is like, you gotta, I, I think you gotta keep them on a level. 
you know like the like David Beckham talks about it when he had um, Brooklyn wanted to get a new pair of football boots and he said we'll go get a job then yeah for sure and he made him go and work in a fucking coffee shop absolutely like because yeah. kids need to do that they do but the amount of times I'll talk to a kid now is 20 mm. still living at home yep Mummy and daddy are fucking paying for everything. Yep. They just bought them. Their first car was a Mercedes. Yep. And you're sitting there like, what in what world? Like, fuck me. Like, what was, is that? Like, what? How what is, that, is helping that helping you in anything? any way? Absolutely. Just Absolutely. creating a soft mentality. And when they actually do find out what the real world is like, they're going to get a big kick in the fucking guts. Oh, my God, yeah. So. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I um, My gran would, when I live with my gran, my gran would just give me stuff all the time. You know what I mean? And that that, that, that made me end up um, having a very terrible relationship with money and stuff like that. What do you think your biggest fear is about uh, being a father? What, what, should, what would you say your biggest thing that you're worried about in terms of being a father? Um, my biggest fear about being a father... I think it's not being present. I think I've worked on that quite a lot. What, in terms of just mentally or physically? Or yeah, like I just, I just think like we're quick, we're very quick to want to work more yeah. and, and, and strive yeah. for this next thing. And actually your kids are going to appreciate it more if you're just around them. Um, I don't think, I think toxic hustle culture at the moment like in my industry, you see it all the time in these fucking real estate agents and they wear the same blue suits with the fucking white shirt that's like fucking the collars like this. I'm like, you look... <laughs> they look like idiots, You look they? fucking ridiculous, man. They look sleazy. Like, you look ridiculous. Yeah. You look sleazy. Yeah. Like if you were around my daughter, fucking... Yeah, I'd send absolutely. You, I'd send you packing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, but like you watch these guys and they're like, you got to make 200 phone calls a day and wake up at four o'clock in the morning and go fucking running and do ultramarathon. Like, I, I get it's, it. It is toxic. Like, I get it. Yeah. But also, mm. fucking, do yeah. you, are your kids going to appreciate Absolutely. that when they're 18 years Absolutely. old? They're going to look back and they're going to go, dad weren't around dad that much. Dad weren't around. Um, and, you know, they would have fucking loved you whether you were driving a Ford Focus or a fucking Bentley. It didn't matter to them. Um, so I think that's probably, that's one thing that I'm, very cautious of especially during this first four years because um i just want to make sure that i'm around and i can pick them up from school yep. and, and you know Create have friday afternoons with them. Yeah. with them and go camping on you the weekends and stuff like that and like you know what if a client wants to call me if a client wants to call me at 12 o'clock on a saturday you can fuck off like i'm not going to answer the phone because i'm with my kids and with my family you know i'm just not going to do that you know you've got to have boundaries i think and ultimately, your family's more important than your work at the end of the day. That's so. what you're doing it all for, isn't it, really? Yeah. That's yeah, what you're doing yeah. it and for. And if you're, doing, if you're working too much and you're not spending time with your family, you're not really doing it for your family. No, absolutely. You know? You're doing it for yourself. You're doing it That's for yourself. That's what you're doing. You're doing it for yeah. yourself. You're doing it to escape anything. Yeah. I think I, I heard someone said recently on, on some podcast was, I think, like 90% or, or 95% of the time that you will ever spend with your kids is in the first, like, 19 years. Yeah, that's when you put that puts it into perspective. It's like after that, you barely see him. Barely see him. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like that's mental. And I think that's why I've ended up trying to decide to be a uh, have a be a father later in life because I can never work the way I've had right now with a kid. Yeah. You know, I never would have got to the, the, the scale I've got to mm. with a, with a kid. I know that. You know, yeah. so I've always decided I'm going to sacrifice a lot of my life yeah, in why, some ways. Yeah, why you can? Yeah, I'm going to yeah. sacrifice mm. while I can, but I'm going to. I was ah, oh, going to be an older dad. I will sacrifice being an older dad to mm. make sure that when my kid finishes school I'm there at 2.30 to pick him up yeah. you know I'm around 100% that's, that's what's most important and I love important. it and they run after you they run, run after, after you, you and like daddy you know, you absolutely know, and you haven't yeah. got to answer the phone and stuff yeah. like that so put in the hard work right now and then yeah. later in life you can kind of take your foot off I'm gonna we're, we're, we're obviously gonna do another one I think we're trying to plan a like we're gonna do like some some group chats and get panels going on uh, just before Christmas. But I just want to wrap up one last question. Sure. Go Are you it. happy? I am happy. Yeah, I am happy. I got <laughs> um I got stuff to work on, but I am happy. Yeah, I, I am happy. Yeah, I'd say so. Nice. Thanks, mate. Anyway, cheers I, for coming on. Are you happy? I'm happy, mate. Yeah, I'm very happy. You look good. <laughs> have you been working out? I have. Yeah, a little yeah, bit. Good. Yeah, good. You were getting I've a bit plump. I've still got to lose a few. You have to lose a little bit of plump. Fuck yeah. Off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll lose some kayaking this week. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah, nice. Thanks, Cheers, mate. Thanks Appreciate for coming it. on. Awesome. Cheers, buddy.